All right. Hello, everyone. Happy Blockchain Week. Let's see, do we have everyone here? Karen, good to see you. Hi, Andre. How are you? Doing well. Hi, Tyrone. What's going on, my man? I think we're just waiting for a couple more people to show up here and then we can begin. We'll give them just another moment to, uh, to join the, the stream here. Let's see. Okay, so uh, while we wait for the other panelists to join us, why don't we go ahead and, and get started here. My name is Andre Serrano. I lead partnerships for the Electric Coin Company. We are the creators and developers of Zcash. And today we'll be discussing financial exclusion and the role that cryptocurrencies can play in creating a more inclusive financial future. Many of you are probably already aware. Hey, Carlos, thank you for joining us. Um, many of you are probably already aware that around the world, over 1.7 billion people lack access to basic financial services. What you may not realize is that right here in the Bronx, 30% of people live in poverty and more than 50% of people are either unbanked or underbanked. So this is a big problem globally and it has uh, significant implications right here in New York City as well. And so we'll be discussing, can crypto fix this and what are the use cases that will really drive adoption? Before we begin, I wanna kick us off with a quote that uh, I, I think will speak to some of the themes that we'll be discussing today. It's an American proverb that goes, if you owe the bank $100,000, the bank owns you. If you owe the bank $100 million, you own the bank. And I think that this quote really speaks to the role that money and power have played in the widening social and wealth gaps that exist today. So uh, I'll leave you with that and I'll turn it over to the panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves. Uh, Karen, would you, would you mind kicking us off? Sure, good afternoon, thanks Andre. Uh, my name is Karen Batia, and I'm Senior Vice President at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. We're considered the city's economic engine, and uh, we support entrepreneurs, innovation, and ultimately the goal is to help companies start and scale here in New York, because ultimately those lead to good jobs. So I head up our creative and applied tech strategy. Um, so that is specifically thinking about ways in which we could support those industries facilitates uh, tech growth in New York City and to make sure that it's inclusive across the five boroughs so that everybody has access to resources to be entrepreneurs in these sectors as well as work in those sectors. Uh, Carlos? Oh, well, we can't hear it. Carlos, I'm, I'm not getting your audio. Sorry, can you hear me now? There we yes. go. All right. Uh, so, hi, I'm Carlos Acevedo. I am director of sales for Brave Software and also the founder of Crypto Community Project. Um, I actually came to Brave after being a public school teacher in the New York City for about 15 years. Um, we've held two boot camps with the support also of Electric Coin Company, where we brought local uh, students, both in college and adult returning, to uh, receive education in crypto and be exposed to professionals in the industry. Both both Karen and Tyrone of also, and you as well, Andre, have been present there. So I thank you for that. Um, and now I, again, work for Brave Software, the privacy by default browser. All right, Tyrone. Tyrone Ross, uh, Director of Community at Altruist, which is a uh, digital online brokerage platform um, also founder of 401, which is a storytelling consultancy and a licensed financial advisor 
um, and uh, managing director of Eagle Brook Advisors, which is in venture-backed all crypto RIA that I am excited to be launching soon. So happy to be here. This is awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm really looking forward to this panel. This is a topic that is really near and dear to me, and um, I'm really grateful to be joined here with you all with such a wealth of uh, knowledge and experience in this topic. So uh, let's go ahead and, and dive right in. Um, I'd like to start at a high level. How do we define financial exclusion in a data-driven economy? Uh, and Tyrone, why, why don't you keep the, keep the mic for this one? How do we define financial exclusion um, in a date? Well, again, I think you start by just acknowledging there is a digital divide. And I think if you want a prime example of what that means, if you, you look at exactly what's happening now with the CARE Act and those without a bank account, is going to take them five months to get their stimulus money at best. And those that do have access to banking and digital banking um, can get it in and, you know, have gotten it um, and as little as a few days after that went out. But I think the main thing we need to understand here, and I think the key word, which I like, is we always frame these conversations as uh, inclusion, financial inclusion, but we need to focus on the exclusion part. What keeps people out? Right. What what is the you know banking deserts? What what are what are the places where folks are forced to you know interact and transact in commerce without access to banking and these type of things? So I think addressing the exclusion part systemically, right, and, and a lot of the things from a racial standpoint is paramount when you start to have these discussions. But I think right now in this day and time, you just look at the digital divide and those that are completely shut out of getting help simply because they don't have access to banking. Yeah. yeah, so you mentioned uh, banking deserts. For, for anyone that's not aware, this is essentially where it is unprofitable for a bank to open up a branch in many neighborhoods, right, that are often very rural or very urban. And so it, it really forces residents in those areas to turn to alternative financial services that are often predatory, right? So, um, Karen, maybe you can talk about, uh, you know, who is excluded? Who are we talking about right now? And um, how did we really get here? I think there are several factors as to how we got here, but I want to contextualize this first, Andre, in um, what Tyrone has, was just mentioning in terms of the CARES Act and um, the payroll protection program that was, uh, you know, the stimulus package, several of them that were um, unveiled uh, over the course of the past month. And so when we're thinking about um, who's included and who's excluded, you know, we talked just briefly about um, individuals. And uh, the importance also is its effect on small businesses and access to the capital markets and access to banks for small businesses. And, you know, I think we should put it in the context of thinking about the importance of small businesses in um, the outer boroughs in New York City importance um, in regards to how they affect impact, economic impact throughout the United States. And there are about 31 small businesses in the U.S., and they contribute to about 50% of U.S. G GDP, which is extremely significant. And um, access to banks um, and access to relationships has been incredibly important for individuals and for banks in order to develop credit history, in order to access loans, in order to access insurance, and in order to access the capital markets in general. A lot of these small businesses have been struggling to receive these relief programs and um, uh, essentially capital, which is what all these small businesses need across the board in light of COVID-19. And you know, outside of this pandemic as well, but you know, I think this pandemic just exacerbates and just shows us the stark disparities that exist. A lot of this has really kind of come to light I want to also put this in just kind of a few more stats that are out there that I wanted to share, and that is about 81% of small businesses are actually sole proprietorships. So it's just one person who owns them. Of those, about 45% of them are not able to sur survive past a couple of months because of COVID-19 right now. That's a significant amount. And according to a recent CNBC survey monkey survey that was done with small businesses, there were about 2,200 small businesses that they surveyed, only about 13% of those small businesses that were applied, that applied for PPP relief actually were approved. 13%, that's so insignificant. 7% of the respondents already received financing and 18% were still waiting for a response. And that was just PPP. If we look at other relief programs like 
the SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan Emergency Advance that provided $10,000, only 3% of small business owners surveyed were approved. So if you put that in the context of you know, small businesses contributing to 50% of GDP and what dire straits they're in right now, that's you know, really, really remarkable for our economy as a whole. And so when we're thinking about access to the capital market, markets, when we're thinking about access to banks, it's imperative to think about who is being included, who's being excluded and why that is. And it affects both individuals as well as, well as the small businesses that make our economy run. I think that's a really good point. And, uh, you know, access to capital is really the lifeblood of entrepreneurship, right? This is how people uh, start new businesses, make new investments, and have the uh, ability to be resilient during periods like COVID-19, where uh, there, there is a significant economic shock. You know, also, according to the Brookings Institute, you, you've touched on this, this a little bit, but um, you know, access to capital, business relationships are also really significant for uh, minority and female owned businesses, uh, as well as access to uh, skills and development programs. And so Carlos, I was hoping you could touch on how you think about the importance of these factors and maybe how you've sought to incorporate that into your uh, the crypto community project. Well, so crypto community project kind of evolved into something else from where we kind of started um, and that you know, now a knowledge in crypto and the being the like the age of the industry itself and the quality of the professional that are involved, uh, I, I seem that people are very welcoming and open to discuss like how to enter the industry. And so it kind of morphed into a way to kind of give students that I had uh, exposure to professionals on one place and networking opportunities, but also to understand uh, an edge that they might receive from becoming involved in and be getting receiving an education in the broader crypto space. Um, and so, you know, as, you know, crypto evolves in terms of an industry, um, we're going to see more and more opportunities for people to then gain that skill set to then enter into the industry, especially the South Bronx and the or surrounding boroughs, where there is a plethora of young people who are professionals um, and who like, let's, the, the market is the market. They have to compete and to gain, gain, gain employment. Now at this point, uh, you know, the crypto industry does present as we grow opportunities to grow. So really from the base, you can have a new opportunity uh, to, you know, to seed uh, talent from around New York City um, in the crypto space based upon kind of outreach and access to educational resources that simply were not available maybe 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Access to education. And I think a large part of that is uh, financial education and financial literacy, right? Uh, Tyrone, do, do you have any thoughts on, you know, the importance of financial literacy in creating a more inclusive economy and why, why is that important? Do we have enough time? <laughs> 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 I get, you know, this is my bag. I could, I could go, I could go into this forever. I, again, I, there, there, there are so many ways to come at this. And again, kudos to Carlos and, and reaching out for those of us that really care about getting the information to people. There's a couple of things here. One, I talk about the, pro the power of po proximity. In order for you to solve a problem, you have to see it first, right? Which is why I always use the South Bronx as an example, because once you actually go there and you see how the people transact, how they actually work within the community, only then could you then go back and find out what is the best way to solve the problems of the people there from a financial standpoint and what financial literacy they need. So I always talk about my three E's, exposure, education, and empowerment. But the most important thing about financial literacy is this. You need financial literacy and education to start as soon as possible, right? The minute kids are able to read, they should be learning about money. From that point, as, as you start to matriculate through your financial life, you should be able to access information that is pertinent to you where you are. That is where you are in terms of your financial life. I just got married, had a kid, um, you know, I'm struggling to make it. Or zip code, location, socioeconomic status, you should get what you need. So again, as a financial advisor, we have a tendency to lead with the middle E, education. Let's just educate people. Let's just give them all of this information and it doesn't seep in because I need to expose you first. Let me expose you to crypto so you can ask questions. And then I educate you. 
And then I empower you by saying, this is how you actually get involved. These are the resources. This is what you need to read. But for me, it's really important, especially for you know, inner city communities, rural communities, that we understand that we have to meet people where they are. And sometimes financial planning and financial literacy is, and me and Carlos was talking about this, you, you, and, and I, with my own parents, right? They were together 40 years. They just got their first bank account. I helped them read their TD bank statement. They don't know what a debit and credit is. My father literally thought that the bank was stealing from him, right? Me and Carlos had the, Carlos and I had the conversation that some folks don't even know what a maiden name is. And I've been going a layer deeper within my community and saying, okay, well, this is great. We can teach people about financial literacy and we pull them into a digital economy. Now we have to teach them how to use an app and how to link an account. And then what are some of the financial terms mean within the app? So financial literacy is very, you know, there, there's nuance to it, but you, you're unable to give me specific education and literacy until you can speak to my actual condition. Not a moment before then, are you able to give me what I need? So I think we need to start younger. We need to make it specific to the actual communities. The messenger matters here. It'd be great if someone is speaking to me, right? And they're speaking to me, not at me. And they've been in the situations that I've been in. They've been unbanked. They still go to the post office to get money orders. They still use check cash in places. They may have messed up their credit and then say, all right, this is how I fixed it. So I think a lot of it is just really getting specific to the need and proximate to people, getting close to them and understanding that, again, financial planning for some people is I have money on Monday, I need to stretch it to Friday. And it's not always the big picture retirement type of stuff that we look at, but the, the financial literacy piece is very key to just getting the bare basics of getting people to understand what it means to be banked. I think that's such a, a great point. And there's really a lot to unpack in there, right? But Tyrone, and for, for people who may not be aware, you have really built a platform around empathy, which I think is really important here because you need, to your point, you need to get into these communities to understand the problems that need to be solved. We have a lot of technologists in our industries that are building apps and platforms to solve a problem, but unless you were actually talking to those people, you, how do you know you're solving the right problems, right? right. So, you know, speaking of that, um, you know, I want to talk about how we can, you know, what are the actual um, ways that New York City is addressing that in, in building a more inclusive tech environment that addresses some of these problems that we brought up. Uh, can, could you talk to that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, would love to. You know, I completely agree with everything that was uh, mentioned um, earlier on, you know, Tyrone and, and Andre, what you were talking about in terms of, you know, making sure that there is that, that level of empathy that people are able to um, connect with those that are being affected, um, you know, understanding, like you were saying, you know, how they're currently uh, accessing money right now, you know, using check, check cashing facilities and so on. And you know, I, I want to push that a level further. And this is an area that I've been focusing on in um, New York City. And that is, you know, in addition to all of that, which is critically important, is thinking through how do we make sure that all communities across New York City have the resources that they need and the education that they need in order to be the entrepreneurs, in order to be the innovators, to create those. Um, products and those services to serve themselves and their own communities too. You know, unless you, like you were saying, unless you know what a problem is, um, especially those that know it firsthand, they're in the best position in order to be able to solve for those problems as well. And so that's an area that we've been focusing on is helping, first of all, with education. Um, and I'll go into that in a second, especially in regards to blockchain. But secondly, in regards to how do we equip entrepreneurs with the resources that they need in order to actually um, be the business owners in order to be the innovators as well. And so I wanted to talk to you a few things. One is that, um, you know, over the course of the past year, we actually piloted a couple of projects in regards to blockchain. And we do this across a variety of technologies and industries aside from blockchain. But the reason why we got into blockchain is because we saw tremendous potential and people say this across the board that this technology is going to be so transformative, people compare it to the internet. If this is gonna be the, the case, we wanna make sure that all New Yorkers have access to, first of all, understanding what this is, um, are onboarded so that they're able to use these types of products, especially cryptocurrencies, 
Um, and secondly, and thirdly, they have access to resources if they're thinking about developing products as well. And so we launched um, a couple of projects. The first one is we had a blockchain center located in the Flatiron. We had this for a course of the year to primarily focus on First of all, education, and a lot of it was just public education about what is blockchain. So we had these kind of blockchain 101 classes, people would stop in during lunch, they were free. Um, and we had them across the across the five boroughs as well um, with community groups so that people could just get a better understanding of what it was. We also worked with the developer community to help them as well to upskill, to better understand what blockchain applications were, what different protocols were and how they could further develop in this sector. And we wanted people to understand not only the technology, but really the uses. What was the value add of the technology um, and how could it be applied to particular problems um, that they were facing as well? Um, so a lot of it was also thinking about ways in which we could provide, like I said, resources for entrepreneurs who, um, you know, maybe didn't have access to deep pockets. They didn't have a lot of lawyers that were out there, but they wanted, you know, they wanted to be innovators in this field. And so that's what we tried to do as New York City is to level the playing field in which you could have people not only understand what the basics of this technology was in its applications, but also to help support entrepreneurs. We also focused through another project that we had called um, Big Apps for Blockchain is a civic tech competition that actually focused on blockchain applications, particularly in government. And so the primary goal around this was to help government better understand what blockchain was and what its value add could potentially be as well. And so, you know, the education needs to happen across the board. It needs to happen for public, it needs the general public, it needs to happen for the private sector, it needs to happen also for government so that they're able to think about applications like let's say for identity that could be instrumental for providing access and empowerment, efficiencies, streamlining for the public as well. And so we focused on, um, like I, I mentioned, uh, government education and then based on the government um, uh, officials that were coming to these uh, events that we had, we had a competition around three areas and one was actually um, focused on blockchain for identity. Another one was focused on blockchain for asset management. And the third one was focused on blockchain for energy efficiency as well. That was the second project that we had. And the goal was that this could lay the foundation of potential future pilots in New York City around blockchain and these applications. Thing that we focused on as well is to have forums like this. Um, New York City um, partnered with Coindesk to have New York City Blockchain Week. This is the third year in which we're having it in a very um, different type of format. But you know, the city has been trying to support um, ways in which we could share best practices and knowledge around um, you know these technologies. And in the past, we've provided scholarships for consensus as well in collaboration with Coindesk. So this has all been very specific to blockchain, but you know, overall, a lot of the work that we've been doing has been very much focused on inclusion, has been focused on, you know, understanding that if there is going to be any kind of real change that's going to happen, it has to focus um, so that all New Yorkers have access to education and have access to products and can create those products as well. Yeah, I, you know, there's there's so much there and really hats off to you for all of those initiatives. I, I think, um, you know, promoting New York Blockchain Week, uh, the Blockchain Center, I think is a great example. I can speak to that personally. Uh, my colleague Elena used that to actually host the uh, Blockchain Latinx meetups. That is a great educational resource for uh, Latino Americans to come in and learn the basics of blockchain and, and cryptocurrencies. So, you know, I've seen firsthand you know, what you're doing to make sure that New York really uh, stays a global innovation hub for blockchain technology. And, and I think that's, uh, you know, really incredible. I think this is a good segue to, you know, really start to focus on some of the use cases that are really going to drive adoption. You, you mentioned a few in there, like identity, asset management that we can, uh, you know, really talk about. Uh, but, but I want to start uh, with you, Carlos, uh, particularly working at Brave. Brave, from the latest numbers that I've seen, currently at over 10 million monthly active users, and in a lot of ways, up higher. 12? 12? Uh, I don't mean to cut up. <laughs> Give us a <laughs> number. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I want to hear from uh, you. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we're north of 13 million monthly active users worldwide. We're growing about a million users per month. We've got a clip around there, very steady growth. And this is now mainstream growth. Obviously, the you know how I learned about Brave and how most people learned about Brave in our sphere is through the success of the token sale. Um, but after that, you know, Brave has a legitimate use case that is independent of you know how blockchain is incorporated within it. Uh, you know, the privacy by default system and you know, not to cut you off uh, in terms of the question, if you have some more you want to add, but I had to say, give a shout. We're, we're north of that, man. We're, we're growing. <laughs> I love it. No, no, I think that's great. That's exactly what I wanted to hit on. Um, you know, it really seems like Brave is positioned to become the gateway for many people to access their crypto wallets. And, and I think that is uh, really important. Yeah. But, um, yes. Yeah. So um, overall, like, you know, like from my background, you know, hands-on education is the best education, right? Bottom line. When you and I uh, with Electric Coin Company did our work, and, you know, together, what did we do? We put crypto in their hands, right? We, we gave them Zcash. And to do that, they had a wallet, they had to download a wallet. And suddenly all like these terms like public key cryptography or, you know, or the different a mobile wallet versus an exchange versus a paper wallet suddenly made sense. Right. So putting it in their hands. And so to speak on Brave, Brave is a gateway um, to the overall understanding of what blockchain is, not only through their wallet, but just by tokenizing attention. Right. And so here you have you have access. Right. Because the browser itself is free. It's private by default. You don't have to you don't have to participate in Brave Rewards, which is our ad pla our ad platform. We would, we hope you do. Um, but, you know, overall, Brave revolves around things that really, I think, speak to the ethos of the crypto industry in general, which is which is overall kind of privacy, but also consent. Right. So Brave took themselves out as the third party in kind of, it, you know, in the interaction. Right. So we really establishing a reestablishing relationship between advertisers, users and uh, content creators and publishers. Right. And so through our basic attention token, which you earn from your attention, right? Tyrone was talking about it before, about this idea like, look, you have access to this, you have a resource, it's your attention, right? And in the past where your attention has, or currently still for most people who are not using Brave, which you should all download by the way, um, mm -hmm. you are going to get access to the value of your attention that has made, you know, Google, Amazon, like so the, the kind of the kings of surveillance capitalism right now, have become trillion market cap companies based upon the value of our data and our attention. And Brave flips that on its head, right? And so in terms of access, it's free. You can then have, you can earn rewards from your attention to privacy protecting ads. And then you can use those to then contribute to your favorite content creators and publishers directly, right? And so suddenly you're kind of shifting the revenue stream from an advertising based one to one that's based on the quality of content where that if you are creating things that users want to want to consume then they're able to to you know give you back that value directly right and so that's and, and brave again you have a brave rewards wallet which you have to back up with your with your phrase right we also have a, a metamask fork which is a built-in crypto wallet that's available on desktop uh, you know, these, these are things and you can use Ethereum based you ERC 20 tokens or, you know, but you see like NFTs, think about the possibilities for DeFi. You know, I was speaking today with um, someone in Argentina and um, they were talking about how the increase in volume for stable coins right now, um, if you're able to guard your wealth um, in a way that is protected, you know, while we might disparage the, the United States in terms of inequality and in terms of, you know, monetary policy, you know, no one here so far has to worry about the economic turbulence of an Argentina or a Venezuela. So uh, I think in terms of what Brave is offering is an easy way to see how, you know, blockchain or crypto in general can be utilized um, in the everyday world. And that's today. It's right now. And, you know, the 13 million North users have shown that. Yeah, yeah. You, you touched on a lot of important points there, but, you know, in general, attention is the only scarce resource left, as, as we know, right? And so, um, you know, I think that business model, you, just like you said, really turning that on its head, I think is, um, you know, really doing a lot to, uh, 
to push the industry forward. You mentioned about how um, you know the part of the difference between you know being a uh, U.S. user versus some of the other countries that we see around the world, Argentina and Venezuela, uh, I think are good examples where the dollar is in very high demand, right? Mm -hmm. And so people are, um, especially people that maybe don't have access to bank accounts are able to get access to US dollars uh, through uh, like stable coins and uh, other uh, mediums of exchange like that. Tyrone, could, could you maybe um, you know talk about this use case and, and why it's important to bring people into the uh, crypto ecosystem this way? So again, you know, just piggybacking off, uh, you know, of what Carlos, you know, was mismentioned with Brave. Again, I, I have to admit for as, for as much as I was like, you know, Bitcoin is the way, you know, to, to get the unbanked and the underbanked in. And I want to make it very clear. Everyone has their cause. I fight for the unbanked in the U.S., right? I love Argentina. I love Venezuela. It is the, it is, on every crypto podcast, is mentioned on every crypto conference. I love them, the food is amazing. I love the people, beautiful culture. I'm concerned about the unbanked and underbanked in this country that continue to be ignored because the narrative is, oh, they're fine, they have a stable dollar, or it's fine, they have all of these different ways to bank themselves and transact. Yeah, but that is for the multi-privileged of us that can have brokerage accounts and credit cards and so on and so forth. And we forget the fact that the majority of people, the 50 million working poor in this country before the pandemic, right, mostly transacted in cash. Now, as we see, as there's this war on cash, especially in this country now, right, if you look at contactless payments were up 40% once the pandemic happened, and that was the headline, right? And then now, okay, well, not only do we need to get people who are transacting with cash into the banking system, now we have to get them to the contactless part as well. So my fight is for the people here, it's for the people, again, that don't have the access. Now, the best way to do that and why I was so fascinated with crypto was this. If you grew up in an unbanked, financially illiterate home like I did, you realize all of the things that are out there that you have to do and how expensive it is to be poor, right? And how expensive it is just to simply, all of the, all of the stuff that it takes to keep the lights on. It's very expensive, it's very time consuming, and there's a lot of middlemen in between you simply being able to hit a light switch and have a light on. So with that, when I started to learn about Bitcoin, the first thing that I thought about was, I'm like, wait a second. I thought, and I tweeted this earlier, I thought about a SUSU. And I thought about, okay, well, you have a bunch of people that are, it's trustless, they're transacting without a bank. There's no middleman. Everyone, there's a time schedule when everyone gets their hand. Kind of sounds a lot like a blockchain. It just goes back to the 16 to 1600s with Dutch slaves. Right, where the, where the susu came to be. So I say that to say those in the inner cities, especially Caribbean, you know, Caribbean cultures and, and Hispanic cultures are used to not having a bank. They don't trust banks. It's very expensive to do all of the things that a banking system requires. Again, we spoke about the lack of access. So now what crypto does is it cuts all of that out and brings it directly to the individual. And I'm like, okay, what better way to do that? And a great example is what Cash App is doing. If you look at the penetration of where Cash App is most useful is in the South. And I tell people all the time, like, well, you need a bank account. I'm like, they give you a bank account. They give you a routing number. They allow you to get direct deposits. They give you access to Bitcoin and oh, by the way, fractional shares of stock now. This is how we get people in. And as you know, me and you were just going back and forth on Twitter, what's interesting and, I, and why, again, as a financial advisor and looking at the banking system, looking at Ethereum now and why I feel like the future of financial services on Ethereum is exactly what was mentioned. Stable coins, right? So now, right, you have fiat denominated stable dollars that are digital. Great. Again, we have to get to that divide where we pull people in, but also decentralized finance where now once we expose these folks, and I was mentioning, you know, back to that tweet where those that actually run susus and tandas or hands, whatever you call them in your country, if they were aware of local Bitcoins and also aware of decentralized finance, just simply from an education standpoint, now they're pulling that whole community of people into this ecosystem. Crypto is missing its product market fit. It is the people all over this country that don't have access to banking or they're underbanked, right? Or they can, and I tell people this all the time, go to any inner city community in this country, I do not care, and go to the post office and look at the line of people. Carol Ross, my mother included, still goes to the post office 
to go get money orders because it's a sense of community. It's cheap, right? And we haven't even begun to talk about remittances. If you know anything about remittances, right? We all do. We shake our head. We know how expensive that is. We have family members. In a, I have an uncle in Guyana. My dad always is sending money back to, to South America. And, 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 you know, we have a bunch of family members there. That's super expensive. So I think with stable coins and the introduction of, again, local Bitcoins and just crypto in general, if we frame it starting again, the messenger matters and understanding what people are. If I, I promise if we took that same time to sit in front of a room of folks and just, this is a Susu and this is what crypto is. And they'll go, oh, well, it's, okay. It's like a Susu on your phone. Is that what you're saying? Like, so it, it'll immediately get them to relate. So for me, I think as, as I start to look at, you know, the, 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 because you get, you get mass acceptance before mass adoption. Right. And we just need people to be exposed and accepted as a viable way to bank a viable way to live, a viable way to transact. And then they will adopt it once it's made easy -er, <laughs> right, to actually use it. So that's what I'm so passionate about is that I think, and, and again, if you, if you look at Americans and the access that we have, most of these folks have one of these. They have a phone, I don't know if you can see it, but they, I'm holding up a phone, they have a phone. So once you have a phone, we're halfway there. Right now, we need to, you know, we need to fill in the rest with examples and education and resource. Yeah, Carlos and Karen, I, I want to let you respond to that because I feel like it probably, um, you know, jogged something for you. But I just want to add on to to what Tyrone said really quickly, which is that you know we saw uh, Cash App have a significant effect um, in response to the COVID nineteen nineteen pandemic, right? Where people that did not have access to a bank account would not have received their stimulus checks until August at the earliest, right? And for, as we know, people that don't have access to financial services that live paycheck to paycheck, month to month, that is uh, way too much time uh, it, to uh, delay these sorts of stimulus payments. So, you know, Cash Up really came in big there and, um, you know, they just, renounced, they, they just announced their uh, earnings report last week and you know Bitcoin is one of their largest revenue drivers right now um, and so you know Carlos and Karen I, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to Tyrone but I also um, you know would like to talk about you know why having um, why uh, having such a profitable opportunity is really important when we look at the business case for driving adoption for uh, cryptocurrencies so I, I do want to say, Karen, I'm sorry, just if I can just speak one thing about what Tyrone was talking about. You know, I spent a lot of time um, with my students who were 18 to open online bank accounts, right? And this is a new, and not just Cash App, because Cash App is relatively new, uh, VNMO is relatively new, but, you know, like uh, companies like uh, Ally, for example, like I, that provides, like for the banking deserts, I mean, this is what I mean, that, that phone that Tyrone you know, put up that we couldn't see. <laughs> that was, that, that's an opportunity. So if you're 18 years old, you can have a bank account, right? You can have some, you can have a checking account, a savings account, you can have a brokerage account. And these are things that are brand new um, and something that just wasn't available. Uh, and I will say like uh, one thing to Tyrone, we just started, man, we're getting there. Let's say yeah. like, well, this is it. Like we are doing that right now. I mean, yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> the technology is ten years old. Give me a break. We're gonna get. <laughs> we're gonna. We're gonna get there, man. But that's that's overall, you know, like the, the you know the the unnecessary uh, kind of the not the unnecessary kind of brick and mortar banks. You know, in neighborhoods that are frankly not profitable. I mean, let's be. You know, if you're a business, you're you're a company, a bank owns a business. Like they have costs, and it's, so if it doesn't make sense to have a branch, like I get it. It's like it's and it's it's not equitable. But now with 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 the with uh, like online banking and such, we do have the availability of resources and access that we didn't have before. I want to make something very clear that that those populations are profitable. That's nonsense, and not I'm not saying nonsense to you, but that narrative needs to stop. Because you know who are, who backs EBT cards, J.P. Morgan, and they charge for every little fee for people to have EBT cards and, and transact. So the narrative what I meant that, was the building, the building right. itself. That's what no, I mean. No, no, the I, I hear, and I'm not directing this at you, but it's and if if that wasn't the case, then you wouldn't have all of those other places and resources to go to payday loans or whatever and check cash in places that make so much money off of those people. The issue, as we know, and you and I know, is a much deeper. And again, not directing this at you, but 
it's very profitable to work with those people. The issue is they just don't want to. And I can speak specifically to that as a financial advisor. And it's the truth and why I raise hell about it. They just don't want to work with those people. Let's address that. But let's not make it a fact that we can't actually extract resources from them because you do every single time that there's there's something that has to get to those people, you jump in the middle of it to take a fee. So I definitely I agree with you. I'm, I'm just speaking more of the broader context because there are people that are listening that are change makers in my industry. And I need them to understand that is a very profitable group of people to work with. You should not ignore them and continue to ignore them, but create things that are allow them to pull them in um, and, and bank themselves and, and, and you actually transact and, and have commerce. I wanted to jump in here as well, um, just in regards to that. I completely agree with you, Tyrone. There's a business case for this. Absolutely. You know, there are 20% of the world's population is unbanked. That's significant. That's a significant number of customers and clients. And that's globally. I'm not even talking about New York City. There's a significant number in New York City as well that are unbanked, underbanked, people that are sending remittances back to their home countries as well. Um, and as you had mentioned earlier, you know, like I, I think the number is about two thirds of unbanked people have phones. Yep. And so they have the resources in order to actually be able to transact um, using blockchain, using cryptocurrencies as well. Um, a, a couple of things that I wanted to mention is, you know, I think part of the, the challenge is there is a market need for this. And so there is a business case for this as well. Um, a couple of areas that we've found is um, onboarding people to make sure that people feel comfortable using the technology, understand it as well, is one of the obstacles, I think, to acceptance or kind of adoption. And the other one is also focused on data. And so we've been talking about financial literacy here, to some extent, digital literacy is what we're talking about, kind of comfort with technology, but also data literacy. And I think that's a critical point, is making sure people understand what their data is being used for, how it's being used, how it's affecting them. And I know, Carlos, this is some of the, the work that Brave is actually doing as well, but it's a critical aspect, especially when we're thinking about the communities that are unbanked and how their information is being used as well and, and profited from. So um, that's another aspect of, you know, another aspect of the data too is that, you know, a number of communities are concerned about um, volunteering information or providing information to technologies and how that could potentially be um, used against them in some capacities as well. So, you know, I, I, that's another area where I think that there needs to be greater understanding across the board, both for the public as well as for government. But Tyrone, and if I could jump in here, um, Andre, and just kind of uh, throw a wrench in things, Please. you know, I think we all agree that there is um, a business case for all of this. There's a significant amount of money that could be made across the How do we, um, you know, facilitate that? You know, when we're seeing here and we started off by talking about the CARES Act and PPP, when you see banks that are only transacting and providing these, these loans and relief programs for their current or existing clients, um, and there's a significant segment of the population of small banks, of small businesses that are not able to access banks as a conduit in order to get access to relief programs, that's a problem, you know? Um, so what are ways in which we could think proactively about incentives and solutions um, so that we are able to help facilitate more of this type of adoption and access? So anyone that follows me on Twitter and probably knows what I'm about to say next is I've been on a mission the last probably year. I feel like those of us that are in financial services, especially financial advisors, have to go first. It is time that we actually bring that education, all of the wealth of knowledge that we have, that we hoard and give to a selective few that now is the time, especially within the pandemic, and I've seen a lot of financial financial advisors do it, pro bono work, actually going through the PPP, helping some of their clients that are small business owners that are actually going into communities and holding things. I've done a bunch of IG lives. Like it is our responsibility. That's just my opinion. It is our responsibility where Wall Street and those of us in financial services have obviously sold our services to the rich, We've continued to be, you know, we are complicit in income inequality because we help the rich get richer. We help them grow, protect, and transfer their wealth. It is time now that we actually scale down and go to the people that need it and offer our services at a reduced rate or free. 
Also, the last part of that, like I said, to your point, there is no reason why a financial advisor, CFPs, uh, CPAs, whatever, cannot donate an hour of their time per day, per week. Let them let them call it with local organizations like yours, uh, lo local organizations or programs. I do it with after school programs. I do it with financial literacy programs. I do it with nonprofits, the SBA, um, the, the NABA, uh, all over the place. There's no reason why we cannot do that. So if we have access to all this information, it's time for us now to break down that barrier because every single time I speak to these nonprofits, all of these programs for kids, entrepreneurs, small, I say, what is your greatest need? Besides money, they're saying people like yourself that will donate their education, right? The education and your time to sit with people and walk them through the basics of what it means to be an entrepreneur, right? And there was a piece I posted today that mentioned small business owners start, most of these 40% of small business owners start businesses financially illiterate. They don't have the basics. That's our fault. We have to fix that. So that would be my answer. I just think the financial services community overall, mutual fund companies, uh, 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 wirehouses, banks, it is our time. We've made enough money. We've done enough. Now let's go to the common man, right? The hundred plus million people in this country that again, as the poor people's campaign have just said that are considered poor and start to help these people, right? The 50 million working poor that also you, you start to get into talking about 401ks wow. and 403bs and what is an LLC and what does it mean to be a sole proprietor? What are the tax implications of that? All of these things we need to, it's, and it's the basics of what we do. It's literally the pittance of our education. That would be a wealth of opportunity and exposure to people. But until we get off our high horse and we get eye to eye and proximate with people in need in the most desperate situations and give them the, again, the basics of what we know, it'll change lives. And not a second before we do that, does this change? So how do we reach those people? How do we extend beyond the people that are on this call, the people that are at this conference and the crypto echo chamber more generally to actually reach those people directly? I'm going to call on you for this one, Carlos. And uh, Susan, nice of you to, uh, to join us as well. <laughs> you, know, you know my answer. Give them crypto. Drop it. You know, right. like create an exceed an economy, like create an economy for people. Right. And not even like to talk, to what Brave does right? Brave creates an economy, right? You earn based on your attention, no matter your education level, your skill level. If you can turn on a phone, download a browser and use it, guess what? You're going to earn that. You're going to earn a utility token, right? And you're able to use that with your favorite content creators, publishers, and through like in the US, we have an agreement with Tap Network, where you can now pay for your Spotify. Again, these are not huge amounts, but these are things that you can earn regardless of the access to your educational backgrounds, to your family, it's like, this is an independent resource that we all have that we've now tokenized and you can use. So if you want to reach people, you, they have to look, I understand, and, and I'm, I'm very like open and, and understanding what Tyrone uh, always talks about and, and preaches with this because it's very important, but we need to understand that people need a surplus before they can think about designating that surplus towards investments and 401ks and these things. And how do we do that? Well, at this point, if we're not going to base it around labor, right, we need to just grant it, right? We need to think about a universal crypto income, right? Where if you want to create an economy, I'm going to hashtag that, whoever's playing on Twitter, or this, do it. it's mine. We're, do we're not take it. Right? Now, no, let's, think, so, let's think about so, this. So, and, uh, Carlos, so, and, yeah. I really like the idea uh, by the way, I love how Brave was one of the first uh, instances of the attention economy. It looks at uh, the behavioral economics of what people do anyway and allow people to monetize, monetize it in a very simple, intuitive way. Right? While protecting their privacy. We collect no data whatsoever on our user sure. base. Sure. Uh, data sovereignty is at the crux, right? Of uh, Now... I, I myself personally have uh, an issue with universal basic income, uh, as in that, you know, where does this come from? Uh, uh, you can't just print it out of full air. I like the idea of universal earned income, right? Just like the attention economy, you have to give something. 
do an activity that is not without of your range and it's absolutely possible when 80% of the world owns a smartphone. Well, so, I mean, I, can I push it, back on that a little bit? Because I can say where it comes from because this, I think, like we can't, we can't judge value on labor. I understand like you want to because in terms of contribution. Now, let's think about this. There are how many crypto whales out there that have the foresight and a lot of luck to, to have quite and a you know bit what? of capital. Any one of them, everyone talks about social impact, including the crypto funds, and I've never seen any one of those guys give anything that don't, they don't make 7x on. That's ludicrous. That's, I don't know. The electric coin company that gave a lot of crypto to a lot of young kids to get it in their hands. And I'm, and I'm calling for a broader effort. Right, because you do have the capital to do that. And if you want to have greater returns, you need to create a market. How do you create a market? You have users. How do you have users? You give crypto because let's be frank, the people we're talking about are not gonna go through the AML KYC process for exchanges. They're gonna be able to buy some on Cash App. They can buy some Bitcoin, but all these things, like put it, the reason why I call it a universal crypto income, which was hashtag right now, that guy to Tyrone, is because this idea, like, it's literally the idea of airdropping, right? It's just magical internet money. Let's be frank. And if we want to create a worldwide economy based upon it, we need to take the whales, the ones, like, let's not even think about Bitcoins. Let's take Satoshis, like, give sats out, like, really give sats out and have people use them. And as you create, you people use them, they're going to gain even more value. So the whales should think about it as a return on investment. You're seeding an economy that you're in the base on. Think about it like the, the Spanish uh, conquering the new world, right? They became they came upon a treasure trove of capital that they're able to base an empire on, right? And then fund the, you know, all the credit in Europe for the next two, 200 years and really having their ascendancy to the top until they fell. My point is we came across a new mine of capital, which is crypto that was created and now has value. And when we were talking about seven years ago, a 10,000 10, Bitcoin pizza is now, you know, talked a lot about how people lost that opportunity. You know, there are people who have a swath of crypto who could give it and create an economy, right? Yeah. And regardless of what people give or contribute for that, like Brave, again, does this with attention. There's nothing that we have to, because again, we'll fall into the trap of like, well, if you didn't do anything, you don't deserve it. We can't do that. To create an economy it has to be, are you a, you know, do you have a phone? Do you, can you download a wallet? Here's some crypto. Boom. You have a worldwide economy based on crypto. That's why it's universal. It's not mean tested. Oh, so, that's, a, that's a great, that's a great point, Carlos. Uh, I will say we have about five minutes left. So I do want to just give a couple of minutes to uh, answer a couple of these audience questions that have come in and some of them uh, apply directly to, you know, part of what we've been talking about. I'm going to start with this one, which is uh, really referring to how can we make the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of crypto friendlier to the masses so that you know right now you still have to pass kyc to get to use a crypto exchange right so if you oh, don't have that to use a crypto exchange so so how, how do you put crypto in people's hands that you know maybe don't have an id going going back to uh the id use cases karen any thoughts uh your mic is muted Karen, we lost your, your volume. Sorry about that. I opened that up to the group. I'd love to hear what the, the rest of the folks have to say about that. You probably know more about how that works. There's nothing mm -hmm. you can do. It's regulation. I mean, you have regulatory bodies that have to go, you have to go through AML KYC to get those licenses. And otherwise, it would just be going against the legatory frameworks, right? Like, for example, in Brave, Re in Brave Rewards, um, you can participate in our ecosystem without going through AML KYC. So you can download the browser, activate your Brave Rewards wallet, earn BAT from your attention, and then contribute that BAT to said um, content creators and publishers. The minute you want to do a fiat on-ramp or off-ramp, then you have to go through our partner Uphold and go through AML KYC. But to participate there, just crypto-based within the browser, you have no need to go through Uphold or AML KYC. So the thing about exchanges, like they're entities, they're gonna have to go through that until we get to like decentralized exchanges, which, you know, frankly, we're not there yet. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I encourage everyone watching this to listen to the latest on the Brink podcast. Local Bitcoins is the way. Point blank, yeah. period. You don't need KYC AML. It's truly peer to peer. And if we are going to reach that demographic, as I tweeted, right, we need more people that are running SUSUs and Tondas and all this other stuff to understand how local Bitcoin works. And then, and only then, are we truly going to get the peer to peer aspect of crypto to folks who don't have bank accounts. And 
educate yourself on what actual Cash App is doing as well. They they solve that issue. I don't know why people don't really want to figure that out, but they solve that issue. And even if it's a situation where it's KYC AML, okay, great. Well, whoever does, those of us that are privileged enough to have multiple accounts, set up an account, right? And actually do, you know, set one up for someone else. And then once they actually have that, send them some crypto. Like most of us actually experienced crypto because somebody sent it to us. So when you really dig in the weeds here of what's actually there, the infrastructure is there to get the peer to peer aspect and the KYC AML out, which again, I live and die as an advisor. You have to do it. <laughs> yeah. I just think the, the local Bitcoin aspect of it and what Cash App is doing is the way right now, hard stop. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm that's a what huge, the question I'm is. A really fan of, yeah, I'm a fan of localbitcoins.com, uh, right? Yeah. And I've been on it. It's, it's great as an OG. I just wonder why they haven't kept up with adoption to further it. It just seems that they haven't done very much to follow through. And there seems to be a great deal of, and uh, this happens with a lot of different, uh, you know, you get used to being a big fish in a small pond. And then when it actually comes to uh, winding or services or evolving uh, with adoption to further it, uh, people want to, and then they get scared because of the oncoming regulation and it becomes an unfamiliar uh, environment. I have a lot of respect yeah. with those guys, but you know, they're, they're Finnish, they're out of Finland. It's kind of like, you know, uh, big fish in small ponds and they haven't really quite stepped up to yeah. Uh, yeah. themselves and grow along with adoption. Uh, because, you know, with, with power comes responsibility, right? As, as Spider-Man's yeah. uncle said. Yeah, and, and for, anyone else that, for, for anyone else that's interested in this topic, I would, you know, highly recommend you check out the research put out by Matt Alberg, he, he's done a ton of looking into the data of how local Bitcoin is being used around the world. It's a great resource for anyone that's interested in this topic. Let's get to one more question before we're out of time. Um, the question is, most Americans have a phone, but do they, but do most of them trust a phone with their money? It's a big jump to go from money order to cash on an app. I, oh my I God. generally agree. I don't agree with that. Um, I don't yeah, I mean, do you know anyone that doesn't? Uh, use some sort of mobile payments I, know plenty. I mean uh, apple pay <laughs> you apple pay. a lot yeah. of how, yeah. how long has paypal been around i mean and it's like, paypal yeah. is horrendous it's a shitty crappy service i'm really sorry but it really is with rapacious fees and how how long has that been around this, this, and this is pg susan this is pg over here <laughs> we got come on there's, there's children listening <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, I think that this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. I think that there's a lot of people who don't feel comfortable using or kind of transacting on their phone. Mm -hmm. um, I think about just kind of like my parents or, you know, my family members and so on, you know, just kind of getting, um, understanding that people are doing it and understanding that there are safeguards and mechanisms in place, what to do, what not to do. So I think part of it is just kind of an onboarding, part of it is education, part of it is a little bit of like a network effect. If you see other folks that are doing this, um, you feel more of a sense of stability or kind of comfort that this, um, you know, that there's safety in it, both in regards to the technology as well as concerns once again about, you know, the data that you're being, that you're providing, whether it's cybersecurity issues or concern about, you know, ultimately who, you know, if there are folks that are, you know, government that's gonna, you know, come and find you or, you know, something along those lines, or if there's um, any way in which your money's being jeopardized. So I think it's education, onboarding, and just seeing other people use it as well. Yep. The education and onboarding is at the crux of uh, a lot of what we're talking about because you're talking about using a mobile phone for payments. Uh, how about people who don't even trust their system enough to you to actually have a bank that still want to use cash? You know, there's like forty as much as forty percent of the Egyptian economy that is uh, you know under wire that goes into the black market. And I think yep. the less there is fidelity and legitimacy of governments and systems, the more that you're going to see people just wanting to use cash. Um, and so it's not even just, you know, how do we get them to that generation of when they're using their mobile uh, systems? It's like, how do you even get them to trust to put their money in a bank? Yep. And we're yep. talking about yep. a lot yep. of the world. Right? Yeah, and, and we, we spoke to this earlier, but, you know, the so much of the economy is just still cash-based right now. And so um, that is going to be a, a big hurdle to, to overcome. But you know, I will say that we are out of time. You know, I hope everyone got as much out of this as I did. Thank you uh, to all the panelists for your time here. Awesome. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you.